Let us pray. Gracious, loving God, I do thank you for this day, Lord, and for this gift to be the bearer of your message, the message that we need to hear in this day and this time in our lives. May I speak, Lord, the words and the truths that you have given us. These things I praise you for, and I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. A childhood friend of my parents, there was two things that she really loved to make every time we would go over to her house for visit. I know my sister's listening, so she'll understand this, so I won't call any names. In the wintertime, we always had fruitcake. I've already preached on that. I wasn't really keen on fruitcake at that time. It was big chunks of stuff that I just couldn't hardly deal with. But in the spring and in the summer, even into the fall, we had fruit salad. The fruit salad was a lot like those fruit cakes that we would have. There would be things in that fruit salad that I didn't really know, and I just couldn't take the fruit salad with a cool whip on top. So he knows I can't deal with those textures. But we would have this fruit salad, and I love fruit of all different kinds. And there are some wonderful fruit salads, but... I remember that as a child being foreign, you know, we didn't, we had potatoes and beans and cornbread. We didn't have fruit salads a lot at my house. Jesus says as his children, as Christians, we're to bear fruit in our lives. Now we're talking about a different type of fruit, but we're to be fruitful people. And of all the fruits that he's given us through his grace, we live as almost like it's the fruit that we live in our lives living fruitful lives, living lives where the grace of God is evident to those around us. In Colossians 1, it says, So that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him as you bear fruit in every good work. As you bear fruit in every good work. So as you go about your Christian life every day, not on Sunday, just Sunday, but every day, The people around us will know that we are His by the fruit, by the Spirit within us. The fruits of the Spirit, love and patience and peace and lifting one another up and carrying one another's burdens, cutting one another's slack. All of those are are fruits of the heart of Christ that lives within us. John Wesley would ask this question many, many, many years ago of his Preachers, have they fruit? He would ask all of those who were coming into the ministry, he would ask them, have you fruit in your life? Have you fruit in your ministry? Can you point to one person you have fed, the one person you have clothed? Can you point to one person whose faith has grown through something you have led them through, through God's Word? Have you fruit? And that question... So important. It's still asked today. It's still of a part of the ordination to become a Methodist minister. Have you fruit in your life? Is your life making any difference to those around you? Denominations have been asking themselves that question for hundreds of years. Have you fruit? Maybe we as congregations need to ask ourselves, Have we fruit? Is the grace of God working in us evident to those around us? Is the fruit of the Spirit within us making a difference in the lives of those around us? Of those in our community, those all around us, county wide and all around the world. We do a lot of things as a connectional ministry. Our fruit is spread to foreign lands. Through our United Methodist women, our United Methodist men, through UMCOR, so many ministries. We give our money and we support these ministries. But what about us? What about me? What about you? Some days I feel like there's no, I'm not using the fruits and the gifts that's given to me. Maybe sometimes I do wake up on the wrong side of the bed. Maybe I do feel not as good today as I did yesterday. You ever have one of those days when people might say, what are you barking at today? But have you fruit 
in your life? Have we fruit as a denomination? Would we be missed as a church if we weren't here? There's a story of a church in England. A man tells the story of a church in England that closed, a church that struggled for many, many years, and finally it was closed. There was a reunion some years later as the members of the church came back and people was talking and the community was talking about different things and a man was asked, what do you remember about the church? And he says, I remember those beautiful bells that would play all during the day. I would remember those beautiful hymns. He didn't know anything about the church, but he heard, he remembered that the chimes would play. And the chimes are beautiful, but isn't there more to people and to us as a church? What evidence is there in our lives? Are we people of patience and peace? Sometimes churches and the craziness of the world, and we live in the midst of the craziness of the world of all times, we lose our way. We struggle with the fruits of the Spirit that are given to us because we balance those with what the world deems as success. Now, if we had successful lives on one side of the scale and we had fruitful lives on the other side and there's one versus the other, would there be a difference? Would it matter? You see, to lead a successful life, wouldn't that be that if we're successful, that we're producing, we're living fruitful lives? You see, success is always something to achieve, something that never will be reached or achieved in our lifetime. No matter what goals that we achieve, no matter how high we climb, there's always more that we need to do. The world tells us that, doesn't it? If you get this degree, you need that degree. If you get this much money, you need that much money. If you get a new car, you need that car, right? Success in the way of the world is a constant imbalance in our lives and it makes us frustrated. And we struggle with trying to be the best that we can be, the best that the world wants us to be. So successful lives doesn't mean fruitful lives. Fruitful lives, living the fruit, living as people of God, letting the Spirit of God, the fruits of God, the grace of God living within us. You see, when we live by the fruits of the Spirit and it's within us and we're living the Christ-like lives, we're content with who we are. We don't need this and that and we don't need the world to tell us what we need. We have the Christ within us. You see, when Christ died upon the cross, we died with Him. And for those who accept Jesus Christ, we in that death, we put away the old, we gain the new, we put on the new. A new creation. A creation who doesn't need all the other stuff. But the problem is, is the world tells us we do, don't they? I shared a story this morning in our tabernacle service. We had a friend who loved the shopping channel. Are y'all familiar with the shopping channel? There's probably several of them. Well, this friend of ours, she loved to watch the shopping channel, and she was retired, and she didn't really need anything, but she would see something, and she would have to have it. And she would order something. She said, I can't help it. She called me Randall. She said, I can't help it, Randall. It just, what, isn't that a useful gadget? And I said, well, sure, but are you using it? And when she passed away, she had this huge pantry. And the pantry was full of these gadgets, never been opened. Things that we just couldn't live without, still in the boxes. And aren't we that way? Aren't we still wanting more when our storehouses are running over, our sheds are running over, our closets are running over with clothes, and we're out shopping, and we're buying more, and then we complain that our closets are too small, we need a bigger house that have bigger closets, we need a walk-in closet. If we keep on, you know what we're going to need? A drive-in closet. But see, the world tells us we need all of that, and it keeps adding to what it is. And even in our church life, in our Christian life, people begin to add things to our worship and add stuff that we need to do. And that brings us to our scripture from Colossians today. Let me give you a little history. Paul is writing to the church at Colossae. He's never been there. The church was started by another follower, another apostle of Christ, a protege of Paul. 
Paul's never visited this church. Paul, at the time of this writing, is actually in prison. Now, this is not a prison as we think in our terms of today. It's a house prison. People were prisoned, prisoners in houses. He could have visitors. He could write letters. As we know, Paul wrote a lot of letters. So Paul's in church. Paul, some people have come to visit, and he's heard about this church. He's heard about the wonderful things that this church is doing, and he begins to tell them about all of these wonderful things. Now, Colossae is a place that really no longer exists. It's in modern-day Turkey. The city proper itself was destroyed by an earthquake in the year 60-62 B.C. It never, doesn't exist. But it's in the modern day where Turkey would be today. And Paul has heard these wonderful things about the church. So, so before I get caught up, I want to, as Paul did, I want to thank you. I want to thank you as a church for all the wonderful things that you have done over the many, many years. For all the rich traditions, all the lives that you have in some way changed by bringing people to Christ. I want to thank you for loving the unlovable and spreading the good news. I want to thank you for reaching out into our communities and providing food and services for so many who were hungry or without shelter or without clothing. I want to thank you for being obedient to God's call in your life and in the life of the church. And then I want to say this, I want to caution us all that we live in a new world. Those things, those wonderful things can never be taken from us as a church. But we're in a new day, in a new world, in a new way, and the things that we did in the past and the way we worshipped in the past are falling on deaf ears, deaf ears today. And there are people telling us we need to do this and we need to do that. To worship. And here's where we come into our scripture today. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. This is Paul's salutation. He's writing a letter. He's acknowledging who he's writing it to, and he's, he's giving blessing. And then he gets into the letter, beginning with verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit, growing just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace and all of its truth. You learned it from Ephraim, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day that we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all the power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of the light. For he has reasoned, he has rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Paul is writing this letter to commend this church what's happened in this neighborhood, in this, in this community. There's a faction of those who, of people who have come into the church and into the neighboring churches. They're bringing in Gnosticism, Gnostics who 
these Gnostics, these other people are telling the people at Colossae and Corinth and the other churches that you have to have this special knowledge to have a relationship with Christ. You, you have to have these special gifts and, and this wisdom that's only given to certain ones who do these certain practices. Then your eyes will be open. Then you will know and then you can have the relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar today? Everywhere we look, there's people telling us what we need to do to, to know Jesus, to have that relationship with him. But Paul's saying these people, he's commending them, and he's saying this to them, and he's saying this to us today. You already have everything you need. You have the wisdom that you need. You have the gifts, the spiritual gifts that you need already. Be cautious of those who tell you there are other ways and he reminds them that once we did walk in darkness, one we, once we did follow the path of the darkness and of those who lead us into darkness, but the light has come into our lives. You see, he's telling them that it's through the cross of Jesus, it's through Christ's death upon the cross, that you've been given new light, you've been given this wisdom. And it's through Christ's death upon the cross that the word has been revealed to you you don't need anything else. Over my many, many years in church participation and in the last few years as ministry, it seems like we've made our faith so complicated. We put in so many things in our worship and in our lives that we sometimes create stumbling blocks and sometimes we don't even get to Jesus because we're so busy with so many other things. But Paul says, for those who have the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of God, the grace of God, the very essence of God, once we accept Christ, we too died upon that cross. And upon accepting Christ into our life, the Spirit of the Lord fills us. You see, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruits of the labor, are simply is this, it's what's in our heart manifesting itself out into the world around us. It's those things. You know, those, um, there's people who keep things in their mind, and they'll say, well, I'm not going to say what I was thinking. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the wonderful things, the good thing, the grace of God. The fruit of the Spirit is the grace of God living in us and living and working around us in our lives. So we ask ourselves, have you fruit? Is the grace of God evident in your life, not just on Sunday morning, but on Monday and Tuesday, you know, those days that we sometimes can be grumpy and frumpy. Those days that we don't want to get out of bed, those days that we can't see any reason to go on, and those days when the church is being challenged. As Paul reminded the church at Colossae, let us be reminded that we have what we need. You know, you can't turn on your television set or your computer that somebody's not advertising something. And if you buy this, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be thinner, younger, more attractive. I don't think they sell much of that, but anyway. But it's the same way in our spiritual journey. We lose focus, and Paul says to us, Remember the Christ upon the cross. Remember the grace that was poured out for you. And in that grace, you have been given the gifts, the key to the kingdom within your heart through the Spirit of the Lord. Have we fruit, brothers and sisters in Christ? Have we fruit as a church? Are we making a difference in the world? And to God be the glory. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as you spoke to Paul and as you spoke to the church at Colossae, and Lord, you thank them for the many wonderful things that they was doing through you. You commended them for their faith. You commended them for loving one another. And you reminded them, Lord, that there will be those who will try to shake that, to take that away. 
those who live by the law which never can be obtained. And Lord, as we try to live successful lives where we find ourselves, even at the pinnacle of success, unhappy, wanting more, looking for something bigger and better, facing new goals. But Lord, when we live a life, a fruitful life, we find contentment with who we are and who we've been created to be. We find peace in the gifts that you've given us, and we find those fruits of your love. We find the patience and the love and the hope and the peace. We no longer compare ourselves to others because we're each created in, in your image with specific gifts that you've given us. When we reach for success in the world standards, we're always comparing, never good enough. And we find ourselves frustrated. We find ourselves hopeless. But Lord, this day, open our hearts and realize that we, the new us, have the gifts that we need to have that relationship with you. For your light that is shining into our lives. May the world know that we are yours. By the fruit of your labor and by the fruit of the spirit. And the things that we say and do. Our attitudes, our behavior. And to you Lord be the glory. Amen. You know, raising children and grandchildren now, we, we caution ourselves, we have to remind ourselves, we have to be careful of what we say around our children, particularly two and three-year-olds. We experienced that this weekend with our three-year-old. She was sharing some stuff with us. And we sort of laugh at that, and it is sort of funny sometimes, but what about when we become adults? And we say those things. And that's what this lesson was about. It's Paul's thought to his church. But for us, his chosen, isn't it wonderful to have the blessed assurance that we're his? And nothing, nothing ever will snatch us from his hands. Let us stand as we sing our closing hymn, 369, Blessed Assurance. All three verses. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my soul.
horticulture and growing different things, but I do know that if you have a fruit tree or any tree, for it to bear fruit, you've got to what? You've got to nurture it. You've got to water it. You've got to fertilize it. You've got to talk to it. You know, talking to plants is a really big thing today. And you've got to give it all the nutrients. And it's the same way with us, with our spiritual fruits within us. We have to water and we have to cultivate them. We have to be in His Word. We have to be in time of prayer and meditation, and even times of fasting. Because we've all been created to grow the fruit and to share the fruit into the world. Receive now the benediction. God of grace and mercy, cultivate within us, Lord, the fruit of your grace and mercy. And may the world know that we are yours by the love that flows from us. Give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to remind us that we are yours. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.